everyone. Welcome to our radio and communications training for Eastern Oregon Search and Rescue or EOSAR uh, Region 1. This training is intended to be a introductory overview of radio and communications which is a topic that's really quite complex and you can really go in depth uh, in your search and rescue career. So I'm Nick Vora. I'm the search and rescue coordinator for the Union County Sheriff's Office in La Grande and I also manage our county's public safety radio system. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is what our radio is used for and how do we communicate typically in search and rescue. So most field to field, that being one individual in the field speaking to another individual in the field, those types of communications on SAR incidents are usually done with portable radios or potentially a radio mounted in a vehicle. Uh, generally, these are analog VHF radios, but depending on your jurisdiction and the type of equipment that your specific agency has, there might be different bands or technologies with that radio system. So, one of the big advantages to using radios over other forms of communication is situational awareness, where Everyone on the team, uh, for the most part, can hear what's being said between other members and it helps people be aware of what's going on and maybe even if it's two members of the team talking to each other, as long as the command post can hear their conversation, it helps maintain that overall situational awareness for the incident. So there's some other types of uh, communication devices that are quite commonly used in search and rescue for different purposes. Cell phones are an example of another very common communication tool. I imagine all of you watching this video probably have a cell phone. Cell phones can be very useful when you need a little bit more security in your communication or maybe you have something to say that's going to be long and not something that will be brief and concise for a quick radio communication on a channel that multiple people are sharing. So cell phones have their place, uh, we use them a lot, but keep in mind how use of a cell phone can erode situational awareness for other people on the incident who aren't privy to that conversation. Then another increasingly common device that we have is satellite communication devices. Uh, InReach is a very common one, also there's spot devices and now uh, probably close to about a dozen different commercial options on the market in regards to satellite communications. Some of the big advantages of these are that they work almost globally and in places that maybe don't have a radio repeater coverage or cell phone coverage can allow a team to transmit a message out or receive a message. Uh, for some of the same reasons I talked about cell phones with situational awareness, uh, need to be uh, keep that in mind, but generally when we're using a satellite communication device, uh, we're using it because that's one of the only options we have and cell phones or radios aren't effective in that circumstance. So now there's some types of public radio, public safety radios that you're likely to encounter in the world of search and rescue operations. Uh, one of the types that I have on the screen here, or that I haven't put on the screen here is FRS or GMRS radios. These are the types of radios that you can go down to your local box store and buy. Uh, they don't require, uh, at least the FRS radios, family radio service, doesn't require a license to use. GMRS radios technically require a license, but they're available for purchase by the general public. And these are very commonly used by people recreating and it's uh, common that maybe the people that we are looking for or maybe family members of the people that we're looking for or rescuing may have those radios with them. So it can be a good idea for your SAR team or members of the team to carry these radios because uh, it can help you communicate with members of the public. But typically for communications amongst the SAR team, we're going to use public safety uh, band radios and not the family radio service or GMRS uh, type radios. So uh, as far as radio types, mobile radios are the, the types of radios that you are going to find in something with wheels. So for example, a car or a truck. Think of something with a steering wheel that rolls down the road. A radio installed in that is generally considered a mobile radio. These have power uh, outputs of 40 to 100 watts. 
uh, being the most common. And the antenna is typically permanently attached to the vehicle. Uh, the next category would be a portable radio. This is the type of radio, uh, such as this in my hand right here, that you are likely to be using in the field as a search and rescue member on the ground. These radios have an output power of anywhere between four and six watts and are what you're most likely to be using for day-to-day -day SAR operations outside of a vehicle. Base station radios are a radio that is fixed. It's not mounted to a vehicle. You can't carry it around. Typically, these are higher power radios that might fi you might find in a permanent command post or a semi-permanent command post uh, or in a dispatch center. And then repeaters is another category. A repeater is a special type of radio that it receives a transmission on one frequency and then almost immediately retransmits it on a second frequency to boost the range. It allows you to take a, a low-powered radio, such as a portable radio, talk to a repeater, which then broadcasts it at a high power to a large area to increase your range of communications. So now we're going to change gears just a little bit and talk about channels versus frequencies inside these different types of radios. So one thing that you will find uh, referenced very frequently in regards to SAR radio communications is the organ SAR channel. Uh, different people will refer to it as SAR orange or organ SAR or maybe just SAR. Uh, in the state of Oregon, the, our primary SAR channel is, has a frequency of 155.805 and that is referred to as SAR orange. And this gives us an opportunity to talk about channels versus frequencies. So 155.805, that is the frequency. That's a physical property of that transmission, the wavelength that that message is being transmitted on. The channel is where it's stored in the radio and what it's referred to in the radio. And that's arbitrary, depending on how the radio is programmed. For example, that frequency, 155.805, could be put in channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, or any channel on a radio. It could, that channel could be named SAR, it could be named Oregon SAR, or SAR Orange. So keep that in mind, the difference between a frequency, which is an actual uh, measurement, it's a physical property, whereas the channel being an arbitrary designation. So now there's a couple types of channels that we use for communication. TAC channels or tactical channels are typically what we're using for people who are operating together, relative, generally relatively close to each other, for uh, detailed operational communications, hence the name tactical channel. So on a rescue operation, uh, the ropes team might be using a tactical channel to coordinate all the different aspects of that specific rope rescue. So generally people close to each other, radio to radio, and it doesn't involve usually the repeaters that I talked about. Now the second type of generalized channel designation would be a command channel. Think of this as the big picture channel. This is what the incident commander is using to talk to dispatch. It's maybe on a larger incident, the incident commander is using it to talk to the operations section chief. And then that operations section chief might be using it to give assignments to team leaders or maybe division supervisors who are then using a tactical channel to communicate detailed instructions and discuss more detailed elements of strategy with the specific members of that team. So think of attack channel, a unit working close together, uh, solving a problem, generally not repeated, but that varies depending on the, the circumstance and the agency. And then command channel is the big picture uh, radio channel. So now we're going to talk a little bit about radio range. And I'm going to focus largely on portable radios. Again, the, these handheld radios that you're most likely to be using as a member of a SAR team. As you increase the, the power of a radio and other factors we'll talk about later, those influence range. So if your radios can see each other directly, and one thing that can be helpful, if you have two radios, think of these as two light bulbs that I'm holding in my hand. And 
because radio waves essentially that's light, just not in the visible spectrum. So if this light bulb it can be visible by this light bulb when it's turned on, that means that these two radios can talk to each other. So if we have line of sight, essentially there's nothing in between the two radios, you can go a really long ways before you can't see that light anymore. So if there's nothing in the way, no obstacles, no barriers, a portable radio at least two miles. Uh, I have seen transmissions of 40, 50, up to hundreds of miles when there's absolutely no obstructions, people on two mountaintops. Once things start getting in the way, then the rain starts to decrease pretty quick. Uh, there are some things that affect that. One of them is the particular band or frequency that's being used. Uh, most public safety search and rescue radio uh, channels are in what's called VHF. VHF is, uh, hugs terrain quite well compared to other frequencies, uh, which might penetrate concrete or buildings better. UHF, or when you get into 700 or 800 megahertz, those work really well in urban areas, but their ability to uh, hug terrain and transmit over distance decreases a little bit. So this presentation here is largely focused on VHF. Uh, radio communications, because that's generally what we use in SAR, with exceptions, depending on the agency. So uh, you're going to get to one mile or less once you start getting some obstacles in the way. And then you're going to get even to uh, maybe potentially less than a quarter mile. Imagine there's two drainages that r in canyons that are parallel to each other with a really high rocky ridge top between the two line of sight or in a straight line uh, by the crow flies so to speak you might not be that far apart but those two light bulbs don't have quite enough power to be able to be seen all the way over that uh, vertical obstruction uh, same thing goes for dense woods uh, that can really decrease the ability of a radio to transmit as can urban areas concrete glass metal those all really degrade a radio's performance. One thing also to keep in mind is being inside a vehicle really decreases a radio's performance. Having, think of that metal cage that you're sitting in. If you're using a portable radio, you're, you're trying to transmit through essentially a mini Faraday cage, which you know something that blocks radio transmissions. So if you have a mobile radio mounted in that car, and the option to use it over a portable, always use the mobile radio if you have the, the channels available. But keep that in mind. Uh, you may need to stop the car and get out to use your portable radio, get outside the car. So now, what if we can't talk to who we need to? What are some solutions that we might use to solve those problems? So before I get into the specific solutions, I'm going to talk a little bit about the factors that influence our range. So we already talked about wattage, or the radio's power. Mentioned a mobile radio could be up to 100 watts, whereas a portable handheld radio is generally at the most a 6 watt radio. So the range is not a linear function with the wattage. Generally, as a rough rule of thumb, you have to square the wattage to double the range. So a 5 watt portable radio you could double the range by using a 25 watt mobile radio, uh, the antenna being equal. So that's pretty significant. But then to double the range of that 25 watt radio, you'd have to use a 625 watt radio, which really you're not going to encounter. It doesn't exist outside of commercial broadcast. So keep in mind the wattage is a factor, but it's diminishing uh, returns as you get into higher wattages. The antenna is huge, and that's something that we can directly change. One being an antenna mounted on a vehicle generally works better than a portable radio antenna. Also, where is that antenna? If you're talking on a radio that has a speaker mic attached to it, if that radio is down on your belt and you're talking on the speaker mic, that antenna is not in an ideal location to talk out. Now, if you hold that radio up, and talk now that antenna has clear, much more clear line of sight, so to speak, to your intended recipients. So keep in mind the antenna positioning as well as the height of the antenna. 
there's potential RF barriers or radio frequency barriers. I already talked about being inside a vehicle. Being inside a building can do the same thing. Also, especially a building with a metal roof or metal siding can really degrade your ability to transmit out. Atmospheric conditions are something that we're just going to have to deal with. We obviously can't change that. And also the frequency, which I already discussed a little bit about the VHF frequency being better in rural terrain as far as hugging the curvature of the Earth slightly, whereas the higher frequencies, such as UHF, 700, 800, work better in urban environments where you have more physical obstructions uh, for, that, um, for that wavelength to, or radio wave to penetrate. And we'll Aldi talked about some of the things that you can change, which are the power of your radio, choosing to use a portable versus a mobile, as well as the antenna and where you're holding that radio. Uh, one thing here, this is a chest pack right here that is very commonly used in search and rescue. Uh, you wear it on your shoulders. Keep in mind where that is on your body. If I'm trying to talk to someone behind me, my body's more than half water, 70% water, I'm trying to transmit through a big, basically a, a water balloon. And the radio waves don't penetrate that very well. So if I turn so that my antenna is facing who I'm trying to talk to, I'm likely going to have a better transmission. Uh, there's been times on actual missions where I have been unable to get out, talk to who I'm trying to reach at all with the radio on my chest and I've simply taken it out of the chest pack and held it above my head and they could hear me plain as day. So there can be a very significant difference between a radio being right here or on your belt versus up above your head. Something to keep in mind. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the types of radio channels, how they're programmed. I already talked about how TAC channels generally are radio to radio. Another way to refer to this is a simplex channel. That means your radio receives and transmits on the same frequency. Then there's duplex channels. Typically those are repeated channels. That means your radio transmits on one frequency but listens on another frequency. And this allows you to use that mountaintop repeater, or maybe a repeater mounted in a vehicle or some other means of a portable repeater, where you transmit on one frequency, that repeater listens to your transmission and rebroadcasts it on a second. So everyone whose radio is programmed the same has the ability to access that repeater and hear the output from other people using it. So now, what if we don't have a repeater? So that's the automatic device, but we have two people, uh, maybe they're two drainages apart from each other. Uh, they can't talk directly to each other, but they need to communicate. Uh, in the absence of other physical infrastructure, we can solve that by putting one person out there with a radio, and that's called a manual relay. So imagine this person over here needs to talk to this person here. We could put a person up on top of this mountain with a radio on the same channel. Uh, they can person on the mountaintop can hear both people and essentially will listen to the transmission from the first person and then just rebroadcast it to the second person. And that is a very simple, very functional way. It involves more people, so if you are limited on the physical infrastructure of radio but maybe have someone available to go sit in a pickup at a high point, that's a very quick way to solve an immediate communication problem. Now, maybe we have a repeater that either permanently exists on a mountaintop or maybe something portable that we can move around and uh, deploy on an incident. The way that works, as I've already mentioned, uh, the first person transmits and this repeater hears that and is rebroadcasting it while they're talking on a second frequency. So other people within range of that mountaintop can hear it. And the way the programming looks like, transmit is frequency A, so to speak, receive is frequency B. And it's very important with repeaters that you talk to uh, your uh, agency head, your search and rescue coordinator, to learn what are the repeaters that you have in your radios that are issued to you on missions, and where are those. Uh, it's a really good idea to have a map or just be very familiar with the different repeaters in your area 
and where they are in your radio. Because during an emergency, uh, it's not uncommon to have different agencies using different repeaters uh, because the programming not, is very unlikely uh, to be uh, identical between radios, if, between a fire department and a sheriff's office. So you may end up having to move a little bit and it's really important to know ahead of time uh, what are the repeaters available to you on an incident. So now there's this thing called talk around with radios. Uh, if you're very familiar with radio systems, it can be an incredibly useful tool or how radios work, but essentially what it does is it takes that duplex programming that I talked about and it makes your radio transmit on what would be the repeater output if you were going through the repeater. But it allows you to essentially use that repeated channel in a simplex mode. So if you find that a little bit confusing, that's OK. Just remember that talk around is something that you generally want to avoid. And if you don't fully understand it, you shouldn't be using it. And I personally recommend, as someone who programs radios for numerous agencies, I disable it in most radios. And if there's one individual who I consider a super user of their radio system, I'll enable it specifically for them uh, because they understand it, they know how to use it, they know it, uh, when it's a good idea, when it's a bad idea. Uh, other people, it generally leads to more problems uh, than it helps solve. So now we're going to get a little bit into radio procedures. So when you're talking on a radio, we've already talked about how there's repeaters out there uh, and other aspects of infrastructure that are working in the background that allow you to transmit. Those take a little bit of time to fully spool up and start retransmitting. And also, if your radio is in scan mode, that scan is a loop going through all the channels that you have set in scan. That can take a little while, maybe up to a second, maybe even a second and a half or two seconds to fully do a loop. So if you just press the talk button and immediately start talking, you, your first part of your transmission could get cut off. And it's really important to, number one, think about what you're going to say. Once you know what you're going to say, then listen to the radio channel. Make sure that there's not someone else trying to talk at the same time, so you're not going to cut anybody off. Then key the mic, wait for at least a full second, just a nice deliberate pause, then start talking. The radio positioning, you don't want to be talking right into the microphone. You also don't want to be talking far away or have the radio down here. Think about just as if you were talking to someone on the phone. It's a microphone, really no different. You don't want the phone out here. You don't want the phone right here. Just a nice distance, about two to three inches away from your face. And press the button, wait a second, pause, and then start your transmission. When we're talking on the radio, we want to make sure that we use appropriate terminology. The national standard for search and rescue and fire incidents is to address who you're talking to and then say who you are. So think of, hey you, it's me. So if I am team one and I am talking to the operations section chief, I would say operations team one or operations from team one. So that they know to start listening, and then I say who I am. You'll notice that some agencies, maybe even an agency that you uh, work for, will use the me to you. Uh, this is being phased out by most agencies, but you will find it. And if your agency does use uh, that protocol, just follow whatever your agency uses. Understanding the national standard is the, hey you, it's me. Also, we want to try to avoid any type of codes when possible. Uh, some exceptions to this might be your agency may use a specific code if you find someone who's deceased or if you find uh, something you think could be uh, of criminal nature. To not come up on the radio and say, yeah, we found a person and uh, he looks dead. Uh, so to just be a little bit more discreet. Uh, but other than that, we generally try to use plain text and not try to sound too fancy or use jargon when we're talking on the radio to make sure, especially when we have multiple agencies working together, that everyone knows exactly what's going on and there's no miscommunication in regards to what a given 10 or 12 code uh, might mean on the radio. Also, message mentioned earlier, you want to keep your messages short. 
Uh, generally, on a search and rescue incident, there's a lot of people that one, they need to focus on things and can't be constantly listening to chatter. Uh, but also, there's people that need to say things. And if you're going on, maybe you didn't think quite clearly through about what you were going to say, and you're like, ah, well, team two, uh, we're uh, at the uh, trailhead, and um, yeah, we're going to be going in. One, you're wasting radio battery. You're using airtime that other people might need. And it also uh, just does not sound very professional for other people who are listening to the incident radio traffic. So there's a fairly standard radio procedure that you'll note very slightly between agencies, uh, but as a, a rough outline uh, to at least get you started, uh, think of it as a five-step procedure. So if team two is at a trailhead, using a repeater on Jute Peak. We'll say that's where the repeater is located and that's what it's called as far as the radio channel goes. Team two would, and they're trying to get a hold of their operations chief. So it'd say operations team two on Jute Peak. So hey you, operations, it's me, team two, on the Jute Peak repeater. Operations would acknowledge by saying team two, go ahead or potentially team two from operations, go ahead. So it's acknowledging, I heard you, go ahead with what you have to say. Uh, team two might then say, we're deploying south on the 2815 trail from the Ike trailhead. So that's, again, team two talking to ops. Operations team then acknowledges, they could just say copy, but team two then doesn't know Exact, what they fully understood, or you know, maybe their operations is distracted. It's a good idea to do a brief parrot or a brief recap of what you understood. So operations might say, uh, copy Team 2 South on the 2815 trail. And then the last part of that transmission would be Team 2 acknowledging, saying affirmative, or that's a good copy, saying yes, you understood that correctly. So that would be the, one of the more formal ways uh, to go ahead and, and do that type of transmission. Once you get into really detailed uh, tactical communications, maybe you're on a ropes team talking about up on, up on main, uh, take the slack on blue, those types of communications. It gets a little bit less formal when you're rapidly communicating. Uh, but think of more command channel type communications. Try to follow that formal process. So now there's some radio terminology uh, that you'll very frequently encounter in the world of SAR. Affirmative is the same as saying yes. Negative is no. Copy is I understand. Copy is not yes. Uh, oftentimes you'll hear someone ask a question and in response, they get someone saying, copy. That's very confusing. Like, OK, I just asked you a question. Are you saying you understood the question? Or, or what exactly are you trying to say? So if I were to ask someone, have you arrived at the incident command post, the correct answer would be affirmative, we're at the ICP, or negative, we're five miles out, not copy. I have no idea what that means. So keep in mind, you're saying you understand uh, and nothing else. RP is an abbreviation that you'll very frequently encounter. Uh, that means the reporting party. That's the person typically who initiated uh, the, the SAR call out, who activated emergency services, and might be your point of contact on arriving. So someone you're getting information from about the incident. Uh, emergency traffic is a very important thing to know about. Uh, there's two terms. There's emergency traffic and priority traffic. They mean exactly what you would intuitively think. Emergency traffic is everybody clear the air. There's an emergency that I need to communicate about. Priority is one step back from that. So this is an important message uh, that I need to get across, but maybe it's not a life or death emergency. Uh, some of the ways that you might see that communicated would be preface your emergency traffic, emergency traffic, operations from team two. Uh, or uh, some agencies, uh, their protocols might be operations from team two with emergency traffic. 
Uh, both would be acceptable uh, ways. Generally, if you preface with emergency traffic, it lets people know, clear the air, I need to start listening, this is important. Uh, also, one thing when you're reading coordinates, especially latitude and longitude type coordinates, instead of using point or dot, which those are very brief words that in stat can get lost in static quickly, uh, that's the same as like yes, no versus affirmative, negative. Uh, when you don't have a very clear signal, it's easy for a very short word to get lost or, or not heard correctly. So if you're saying uh, 145.586, it's very clear what you're saying there versus 145.186. So that's something to keep in mind as a best practice. Now, when we're getting into what you say on a radio, no matter what type of network you're using, some agencies might have digital, encrypted, very uh, robust uh, communication systems from a security standpoint, so you still need to assume that the entire world or people you have no idea about are listening to that. Someone on your team could be standing next to a family member of someone involved, or maybe standing next to uh, someone with the media. And what you say on the radio could be immediately heard by them with no filter or no way of interpreting it before it goes to them. So always keep in mind that what you say is being heard by a much larger audience than what you intend. And if you do need to communicate sensitive traffic, think about what are the other options that are available to you. Maybe a cell phone might be the more appropriate. Uh, and that's something where you could maybe call the command post on the radio and say, hey, do you have uh, time for a cell phone call? Or I'm going to attempt to contact you via phone so that they know to listen for your call. And as I mentioned, think before you speak. Think about your audience before you speak. And also, every agency is a little bit different. Know your agency's specific code for if you encounter someone who is deceased on a mission. Uh, in my specific jurisdiction, we use the term, I need law enforcement at my location. And it's generally understood that you've either uh, found something, uh, found a deceased person, or maybe something of a possible criminal nature that you don't want to uh, broadcast over an open radio channel. Again, just think about what you need to say before you say it. And remember that what you say, once you say it, you can't take back. So now, uh, thank you for your attention and listening to the presentation up to this point. Uh, we're going to step forward here and go into a little bit more of the mechanics of some of the type of radios that you're going to encounter in the field. So now we're going to go over some of the broad types and give a general orientation of the mobile radios and types of portable radios that you're likely to encounter as you work in your search and rescue career. Keep in mind that your agency's radios may look identical or completely different from the radios that I'm going to be showing today. So I'm going to focus more on the general features that are typically common to all radios rather than model specific features. So mobile radios, as I mentioned, those are the types that are installed in a car. So the power can range from 40 watts on the low end up to 100 watts on the high end is typically the range. And here we have a 40 watt radio. This radio has the speaker integrated to it. And it's a fairly small compact unit that can be used in my unit. We have them set up as a portable uh, type feature that we can put in someone's vehicle that doesn't have a permanent installation. And this antenna right here has a magnet on the base that allows us to put it to a car that has a steel body. So on one side of things, here you have a small wattage self-contained radio. Now, here we have a 50 watt radio. This is typically used in a permanent vehicle installation. And generally, a speaker like this will be uh, used separately from the radio because it doesn't have its own speaker. Then we can get into the 100 watt radios. As you'll notice, this radio itself is much larger than the others and has multiple parts. So this part right here is called the radio head. And then this 
right here is the actual physical radio itself. So keep in mind when you're using a large high power radio, there might be multiple pieces. So if it's not working, it's, there's the potential for a failure to be at one of many points. So now I'm going to go over some of the features that are fairly common to mobile radios. I'll start uh, down at the low powered one. So power buttons or volume switches are something that all radios have. In the case of this radio, you push and hold on the volume knob to turn it on. Uh, that's going to vary again by model, but if you don't see a specific power button on the radio, it's likely associated with the volume switch, so, or the volume knob. So you may press it in, you may just turn it past a click to turn the power on. That's fairly common. Uh, now in this radio, you'll notice there's just one knob, there's not multiple. So these up and down arrows are what you use to change the channels. As we move into a little bit more modern and advanced styles of radios, you'll notice this one has a dedicated power button on the radio. It also has a volume knob that is separate from a channel knob. The volume knob is smooth and continuous when you move it, whereas the channel knob has positive clicks as you move it. That's generally an easy way to notice the difference between them. And now this radio right here, you'll notice, appears almost identical uh, to this other one uh, and essentially has the same control interface. It's just separate from the physical radio body uh, because that's larger. Now this radio right here, I only have one with a microphone just to eliminate clutter, uh, but the microphones typically always connect to the face of the radios. So you'll find that as far as mobile radio programming, that rather than having all of the channels just in one long list of hundreds of channels, because these radios have the capacity of ranging from 60-ish uh, channels up to hundreds of channels, depending on the model, uh, we organize them into zones or groups. And generally those are sorted logically based on the use or maybe the agency uh, or the type of channels. So depending on the radio, you will change those zones using different buttons. So every radio has different buttons that are used or to, to change the zones that your channels are grouped in. So keep that in mind and talk to whoever is issuing you a radio on how to change the zones and ideally get a list of what channels are in what zone. And just keep in mind with mobile and portable radios, generally there's some form of grouping like that. So it's not just one continuous list. So mobile radios are fairly straightforward. Keep in mind, uh, make sure you familiarize yourself with the power buttons. Uh, as well as the volume and channel controls. Also, scan is another feature that is fairly common to mobile radios. Uh, in the case of this radio here, uh, scan could be programmed to any one of these four buttons. So it's important to know which of these four buttons actually activates your scan feature. Whereas on a radio like this, you'll see when it's turned on in the lower part of the screen, it'll say scan above one of these buttons. So you know when you press it, you turn the scan off or on, and it will also usually be associated with a symbol that will show on the screen, and I'll show that with some of the portable radios. So now I'm going to move on from the mobile radios, and we'll get into some of the portables uh, farther down here on the table. So what I have here is uh, a suite of portable radios that are all in the same band. These are all VHF radios that you would be likely to encounter in the world of search and rescue. They're simply different manufacturers and different models. So you'll notice on one side of the spectrum we have very small and compact radios. Uh, these are also limited by their transmit power and the antenna. You know, it's a very small antenna uh, does handicap the radio's range to some extent. Then generally larger radios, larger antennas typically are associated with higher transmit powers and wattages, but that's not always the case. All of these radios here are five watt to six watt radios. So uh, similar to the mobile radios, there are some common features that you will find across all of these. 
in the case of all of these radios, the power switch is one and the same with the volume knob. When you turn on the power switch, it turns on the radio, or when you, when you rotate the volume knob, it turns on the radio. And then the channel knob is largely the same across all these radios, but you'll notice one difference. This very compact radio has the channels with up and down arrows, kind of like that one compact mobile radio that I showed. Uh, whereas all of the other radios, and what you're like most likely to encounter, the channel knob is in the center, uh, closest to the antenna of the radio. So your volume's gonna be on the outside, the channel's gonna be in the middle and you rotate that to change the, the channel and the radio. Like mobile radios, these portable radios generally have channels programmed in groups. Uh, most public safety radios have 16 channels per group or 16 channels per zone. And I'll show uh, with this radio uh, right here, this is a, a BK radio, I have a button that is programmed for the zone feature. When I press that, it gives me a list of the zones that, that I then can select from. And then I hit enter to select that zone, and now I have that suite of channels available to me. So every radio, you'll select the zone slightly differently. Uh, with this particular Kenwood, I have arrows side to side. Uh, this Motorola radio has a collar switch that I rotate between A, B, and C. Uh, to switch between zones. Uh, this Kenwood here is programmed with an up arrow or side to side arrows that allow you to change the zones. So batteries and changing the batteries is another very important aspect to understand with portable radios. Keep in mind that it's going to be different on every radio. Uh, generally there will be some sort of tab and I'll flip all these radios over on the back that you use to release the battery. So with this Bendix King, you push down and it lifts off. With this Kenwood, you pull this tab down, it slides off. These Motorola's have two buttons, one on each side. You pull those straight down, it lifts off the back. This one Kenwood is a little bit more difficult where you have to lift and then push down uh, for it to come off and then this one has a switch you pull down uh, at the base of the radio. So keep in mind, uh, every radio the battery is going to release slightly differently. Uh, hopefully it's fairly intuitive, but if you are going to go in the field, uh, keep, in, keep that in mind and make sure that you know how to change the battery. And if you're going to be going in the field on an extended mission or anything that has the potential to be an extended mission, Make sure that you either have a second battery or the ability to potentially charge that radio, or if you're going with a group, don't have everyone turn their radio on at the same time to conserve battery. Uh, if two people are going to be standing right next to each other the entire time, only one of them needs to have their radio on. If they end up getting separated for whatever reason, then they can turn on. Otherwise, use that to try and conserve battery life between your radios. As far as scan goes uh, in portable radios, just like the mobiles, it's going to vary. Generally, one of these, what we call them soft keys on a radio, uh, because they can be programmed to do a variety of things uh, based on what the agency desires. Uh, so there will be a button or a switch on your radios uh, that will activate scan. So it could be a button on the side, it could be a button on the front. That's going to vary uh, and be specific to each radio model. So now I'm going to go over and uh, talk a little bit about some equipment that you may find useful to assist you in using a radio. Uh, earlier I showed this chest pack. Uh, this is my personal one that I use on SAR missions. Uh, I can put two radios in it and it allows me to have one radio on a command channel, one radio on a tactical channel, and a GPS. Uh, that works uh, very well for me when I'm operating in a command role. Uh, as a field searcher, it's unlikely that you would want or need more than one radio. It's just going to be more weight on your chest. Uh, but there's a variety of packs out there. One feature that I particularly like about this one is it holds the radios at an angle. So the antenna isn't sticking straight up and hitting you in the face when you bend over. 
uh, especially in radios with longer antennas that can jab you in the chin or even poke you in the eye. So I like packs that hold the radio at a slight cant. Uh, another thing that you may want to consider purchasing for yourself is an earpiece. Most speaker mics will have an audio jack on them and allows you to plug in an earpiece. This can be very useful if you're riding a snowmobile, an ATV, operating in any type of a noisy environment, or maybe if you are a family liaison or someone in, or operating around the media where you want to be able to hear uh, all the radio transmissions but you don't want it just being broadcast out your microphone. So these are very inexpensive. Uh, you can get these for about 10 to $15. Uh, online or from local radio shops, or electronic stores, and they're very, uh, it's just a good idea to keep these in your SAR pack uh, so that if you ever do you find yourself operating power equipment, uh, you can use that earpiece. If you do have other questions about radio stuff, um, talk to your SAR coordinator or your agency uh, head issuing you the equipment about specifically how it operates. And if you are in a mutual aid scenario, it's really important to talk to whoever might be issuing you that radio on an incident uh, to make sure you fully understand uh, how that radio operates, how to go in and out of scan, how to maybe add and remove channels from scan, and how to change zones. And also importantly, what the zones are and what channels are in them specific to uh, your operation. So if you do have general questions about radio stuff, as I mentioned, I'm Nick Vora of the Union County Sheriff's Office in LeGrand. I would love to have a conversation anytime uh, and try and answer your questions in general uh, about maybe specific radios, or if you're looking at maybe buying some personal radio equipment, try and decide what options are out there. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, thank you for being part of Search and Rescue. Uh, we really appreciate you.